Good evening, ladies and ladies. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the stage, Louise Newson, Kate Muir, and your chair for the evening, Harriet Quarles. Good evening. Um, it's brilliant to see um, so many of you here. Um, I'm 51, so I am kind of slap bang average right in the middle of uh, all of this. And I thought that I knew all about it, um, but it turns out I didn't at all um, until I read these amazing books, which are an absolute um, revelation. Um, so it's brilliant that you're all here to um, hear from the absolute kind of menopause gurus who we're so privileged to have in Trim. Um, Dr. Louise Newson is um, the UK's leading menopause specialist, I think. Um, she's got her own practice, um, her own website. Um, she set up the menopause charity um, and also launched um, an amazing app, which I'm sure she'll tell you a bit more about. Um, called um, the Balance App um, and you know really is doing so much to inform women and others um, to empower you know us to take control of the perimenopause and menopause um, which is just amazing along with um, journalist Kate Muir um, who wrote and uh, researched produced the um, documentary that I know um, a lot of people have seen um, presented by Davina McCall um, and she's also written this brilliant book, um, which literally does tell you everything um, you need to know. Um, and hopefully um, you won't be afraid to ask her questions at the end, um, because Louise and Kate will both be um, taking questions at the end. They, they can't answer kind of individual personal queries, and I'm sure, I'm sure you have got a lot of those, <laughs> but all you need to do is read their books. Um, but you know, if you've got general questions at the end, it would be great to um, it would be great to hear them. Um, so, could could you start by kind of explaining? Um, and I know it's a bit of a basic question, but actually, I realised from reading these books, I didn't really uh, totally understand it. The kind of the difference between the perimenopause and the menopause, and you know, when when are you said to be menopausal? But who wants to? Oh, I have a line on perimenopause, which is that perimenopause is menopause's evil little sister. It absolutely creeps up on you. You've no idea it's there, and no one ever explains it properly to you. Um, and if you, um, in fact, in the next film we've made with Davina McCall, we go on the NHS website and put the word perimenopause in, and we don't find anything except one mention under menopause in another section. We search further and nothing happens. So... Uh, Louise will explain to you what the secret is. <laughs> yeah, so, well, before even thinking about the perimenopause, mm. if we break down the word menopause, a lot of people, I used to do some work with West Midlands Police, and they said, men, pause, get away. <laughs> it's a time <laughs> where no one wants to be near a man. But actually, meno, obviously, is our menstrual cycle, so our period pauses to stop. But what's really weird about the menopause there's lots of things. Firstly, it affects all of us as women. So 51% of the population, there's 1.2 billion of us worldwide we need looking after. But also, um, it, it's something that you can't make a diagnosis straight away. You have to have a year without your period if you're still having periods. So lots of women don't have periods if they've had a hysterectomy or they've got a marina coil in or are using some forms of contraception. So actually, textbook diagnosis is a year since your last period. So you have to wait that time. And so a lot of women might wait 10, 11 months and then have a period. So then they're still not menopausal. And it's a look back in time retrospective diagnosis, which I don't think any other thing, um, any other sort of, not that the menopause is necessarily a disease, but anything else in medicine, we make a diagnosis when the person comes in. So it's really weird to say, no, no, you're not menopausal, come back a year after your last period. So peri, is a medical term for around the time of. So that's where the perimenopause came in. But it's still really complicated because what happens is our hormones usually um, decline quite a few years before our ovaries run out of eggs, which is why we become menopausal usually. Um, so when we've got this decline, it's not a nice smooth line decline, it's this 
yo-yo up, down, up, down. So there are times when women are perimenopausal, they have far higher hormone levels than they mm. do at other times. So that causes a bit of confusion to the body. But also if you had a blood test, you might show, oh, your estrogen level is very high. Um, so, but in this period of time, people often get menopausal symptoms, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, so we don't really call them perimenopausal symptoms because they're the same as menopausal symptoms. They're just related to the hormonal changes. Mm. But as Kate said, it, it's really horrible, actually, because, um, again, there's no blood test, there's no saliva test, there's no urine test, despite what you might be able to buy in Tesco's or Boots. <coughs> um, so it, it's very insidious. It comes in and it often creeps in at times where you're not expecting it. And often periods then change in nature or frequency. But we see a lot of women who have very no regular periods, but they're starting to describe some brain fog, some fatigue, some muscle and joint pain, some headaches urinary symptoms and it will be related to their changing hormone levels it can occur sometimes a decade before the menopause so if we know um, as you say not that any woman's average but the average age of the menopause in the uk is 51 that means that pretty much every woman in their 40s is going to be perimenopausal mm. or menopausal because the average age is 51 so for a lot of women it's younger and one in a hundred women it's under the age of 40 one in a thousand under the age of 30. The youngest lady I've seen who's, who was menopausal at a young age, she was diagnosed when she was 14. So it's not a gray haired lady running down mm. the beach, which is what you see if you Google menopause. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yes, and, it, and even actually when I did this, this book with Penguin, I wanted perimenopause in the cover and they said no no it's too long it's not going to work in, your, in the cloud we would just want menopause and I said no actually because yeah. a lot of people don't know what the menopause is do they mm. and even more people don't know what the perimenopause is um, but like I say most people it's because their hormones just decline we get older our eggs run out the associated hormones go but some women their ovaries are removed in an operation so those women don't have to wait a year before they can have the menopause badge they they just will become menopausal because they won't have their ovaries. Some women have their ovaries damaged by drugs um, or radiotherapy, for example. So there's different reasons. Um, even if women have a hysterectomy and their ovaries conserved, then the ovaries often don't work quite as well um, and they, they probably fail earlier. And that's quite difficult to know because they're not having periods because they've had a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. So um, not everyone has a perimenopause, but we all have a menopause. And once we um, have a menopause, it actually lasts forever. There's this whole narrative about it being a transition, a, a sort of metamorphosis into something. And I don't really know what that something is. Um, <laughs> but a lot of symptoms that people get change with time. So there's a lot of people I will speak to who are maybe in their 60s and say, oh, how are you getting any symptoms? No, not at all. I did have hot flashes and sweats. They've all gone, thankfully. So I'm through the menopause. And then you say, well, What's your sleep like? Terrible. Um, are you getting any joint pains? Oh, yes, yes, I'm getting a lot of joint pain and stiffness. Well, what about if you cough or sneeze? Oh, no, I couldn't because I wear tenor ladies or whatever. But I'm not menopausal. Well, of course, these are all, all symptoms of estrogen mm. deficiency. So um, it's a hormone deficiency that will last forever. And the other thing is, it's very doom and gloom tonight, really, is that um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not just <coughs> symptoms. There's, our uh, estrogen is really important. It affects every single cell in our body. So without it, our cells are not working as well. So there's a risk of other diseases, which we can talk about as well. So that's why the conversation is so important. Yeah. And you know, the work that I'm trying to do is just to raise awareness and then women can have a choice about what they do. Mm. Um, and then Kate's obviously, as an investigative journalist, has really gone behind everything. and. Because when we first met, I'm not sure she quite believed everything I was saying. Yeah. I, I was Louise's patient, you know, and then we became friends. So, it, you know, it was quite, a, in fact, I mean, I, I should tell you just in a way how, how we ended up doing this. I had the, the worst menopause on earth. I did it. It wasn't just a car crash. It was a, a full Selma and Louise off the cliff. I went nutty. You know, I left my marriage. I lost my job. I, everything could, that could have gone wrong went wrong. I got very, very angry and I didn't realize I was in perimenopause and I started throwing things, which I'd never done in my whole life. And, and at, the, at the kitchen wall, never hit a child, I threw 
broccoli, blue paint, butternut squash, and butter in a dish that all wrote with the bits in it, and a copy of Nigella Christmas. And there is, there is that strange thing, and I don't know if you've experienced it, but you, maybe your mothers have experienced it, or people you know, that there is that rage. And that's not really one of the symptoms that you're ever going to get listed on the NHS. But my God, you know, when your estrogen disappears and your loving mummy hormone disappears, and you sort of see yourself as a sort of raw human being, you know, this stuff happens. And I realized the mental health effects of the period, well, certainly on me, were incredible. And you told me a story when I came in to meet you for the first time, uh, which was about a woman who had depression for years and years and years, was diagnosed, given lots of different antidepressants, had urinary tract problems, had other stuff that should have rung bells, but certainly didn't and ended up getting 12 sessions of electroshock therapy uh, because of her depression, only afterwards sitting, and, and she got to a really rough stage, um, only afterwards did she start Googling, and she was just sitting in a chair at home, she couldn't go out, she didn't go out for seven years, and in fact she rented, an, an, no, she mortgaged her house and got a, an RV to go to Louise's surgery because she couldn't leave her house because she was so acrophobic. And she came in and she got HRT. And then she realized what was happening. A week later, her depression just disappeared and she walked her dog for the first time in seven years outside her garden. And when you told me that story, that changed my life because I ended up thinking, but well, I'm an investigative journalist and I was the film critic at the time. So I thought, why, can't, why was I unable to understand what's happened to me? Why didn't I look this up? Why didn't I know about these symptoms? How does it happen to people? How do people get electric shock therapy, you know? And so all of that really galvanized the kind of revolutionary element in me. And indeed it turned out in you as well. And we, <laughs> and we went off. Mm, mm. Um, and, and just talking about HRT and the importance of it to mental health, or, or at least knowing what is going on with your head in menopause and talking about it honestly and bringing this honesty to being public about it is so important, yeah. Well, I think we're gonna talk a bit about HRT in a minute, <coughs> but um, you mentioned some of the kind of common symptoms mm -hmm. there, um, and I don't want to kind of scare people that, you know, are as, as, you know, don't know the things I have found out by reading these books, but there's a whole chapter in this book um, about the vagina, and it did terrify. <laughs> um, do, you, do you want to give people a bit of warning? Because she <coughs> says there are things you can do. Oh, we, we're going straight into yeah, vaginal joy. Yeah. <laughs> I, usually we don't do this straight away, but let's, let's go there. And, and it's, it's, it's a great subject, isn't it, Louise? Because it's basically the subject you can do something about, which is that in your 40s and 50s, for 80% of women, yeah? You are going to, you're likely to, to, to suffer. And when people say vaginal dryness, it's about the hole of the vulva. It's about having lots of urinary tract infections. It's about feeling uncomfortable on a bicycle, never mind on anything else. And, um, and you know, the idea that we can take vaginal estrogen in little pessaries and it makes this incredible difference. You, you're the expert, talk about it more. But basically, we all stop having sex, and not all of us, but lots of people stop having really good sex when their menopause and perimenopause arise because it's very uncomfortable and you have to change what you're doing or whatever. And actually, that doesn't need to happen and it doesn't need to happen to anyone. Even women that have had breast cancer can use a tiny bit of vaginal estrogen. So it's, it's a win-win, isn't it? Yeah, so I mean, estrogen <coughs> gets everywhere, like I've said, but the lining of the vagina, the vulva, even the uh, pelvic floor, tissues, the um, part of the bladder, um, the urethra, the bit we wee out, it's all got tissues that respond to estrogen. So without it, tissues become very thin, very friable, um, not elastic, and they need to be elastic so we can walk, so we can, you know, sit down. And we need some cushioning, it helps build collagen, it helps the blood supply in that area as well. And Kate said, we know from studies that about 80% of menopausal women experience some symptoms. And vaginal dryness is a really horrible word because some people actually have more secretions, so they're not always feeling dry. They used to use the term vagina or, or, or vaginal atrophy. Well, if you look up atrophy in a dictionary, it's, it's withering and wasting away, which <laughs> none of us want to be doing that. Um, so now they've changed it to GSM, which is genitourinary syndrome of the menopause, which is a really long mouthful. But the good thing about it is it talks about urinary 
symptoms as well. Um, so some people don't have any vaginal or vulval symptoms, but it's, they have um, some, some leakage, some, some incontinence, or they have recurrent UTIs. Um, and if you look at the incidence of urinary sepsis in women, it really goes through the roof. Um, and so we know also <coughs> from studies that only around 8% of women receive treatment. So if you do the math, that's the majority of women not getting treatment. And most healthcare professionals don't have any menopause training. Um, so my husband's a urologist. He would does now because all I do is talk about menopause but um, <laughs> he didn't really know much about how important <coughs> vaginal estrogen is so we'll talk about HRT but HRT is a systemic treatment that gets all around the body including around the urethra and the bladder and pelvic floor which is great but there's also vaginal hormonal treatment so this is um, either a cream or a gel or a pessary or there's a little uh, vaginal ring that gets, you can insert in the vagina and that gives estrogen all to those local tissues because it's very localized and the dose is very low it doesn't affect systemically so those women who don't want to take hrt who feel they can't have it first line or women who might be more apprehensive say for example if they've had breast cancer can very safely use vaginal estrogen and it works to clump up the tissues and improve the blood supply improve the collagen so urinary symptoms improve and the vaginal dryness symptoms improve and as Kate says, most women, certainly I speak to in the clinic, haven't had sex for a year or two, but they've never spoken about it. No one's ever asked them as a healthcare professional. And what's really sad is that, you know, we're quite Victorian, aren't we? People don't like to talk about sex, but it's very, very important. And we know from studies that men who have sex at least twice a week perform better at work. They have lower <laughs> blood pressure. You know, they have lower risk of heart disease. Um, so actually, there are health benefits for for sex, but, but it's also start of, a, of this intimacy that goes. A lot of women say, well, I just don't want to hold my husband's hand because they're going to get the wrong idea. Um, or um, I just go to bed early and pretend I've got a headache and I just pray that I can be asleep before he comes upstairs. And then it, it just starts that wedge going between couples. Um, but I've also heard some awful stories of women that do have intercourse despite having awful vaginal dryness and one lady said to me well it's, it's like having a red hot cocoa stuff inside me but I know it won't last for long um, my husband's so desperate for sex and then it then it finishes and I think goodness me it's not going to be again for another few weeks but this is just the slippery slope and but there's also a lot of women I speak to who can't sit down for long periods of time they uh, find that wearing underclothes is very difficult as well and these are all things that we're not talking about, there's no yeah. headline news about it. Um, you know, we'll always read about um, breast cancer, we'll always read about cardiovascular disease, so heart attacks, whatever. We won't read about the women that are not able to exercise because walking and running is so uncomfortable. Yeah. And, you know, this has massive, massive impact. Um, and it's dirt cheap, cheap and very safe. Um, so, yeah, so there's, it's, no one should be suffering. And, <coughs> when i had a bit of menopause training not much i was told that you get hot flushes first and then you might get a, a few sort of other sort of joint pains maybe some memory problems and then you'll get vaginal dryness it doesn't work like that there's a lot of perimenopausal women who have vaginal dryness as their first symptom and uh, one of my patients recently um, came to see me about six months ago and she was 38, so she'd been told she was too young to be perimenopausal, which of course she wasn't. And her only symptom was vaginal dryness, but it got to the stage where she felt it was like a blowtorch between her legs. And she worked as a teacher, so she couldn't concentrate, so she gave up her job. And she was newly married, and even at night time, everything gets worse at night, doesn't it? But the pain was just awful. So she was suicidal, for very different reasons to the lady that Kate described initially. Um, and she went to see a gynecologist, a urologist, and she went to see several other experts, and they all gave her different treatments, and then said she was probably in her mind, so gave her some antidepressants and some gabapentin and other drugs. And then she came, and we gave her some systemic HRT, because she needed it because she was young, and some local hormones as well. And I saw her in my clinic a couple of weeks ago, and she came in, and I... I had to double check the name because she was a completely different person and 
you know, she's doing a lot of awareness because actually if you go onto the NHS website or look at NICE guidance, it won't talk about the perimenopause, it will, won't mm. talk about how difficult and extreme these symptoms are, actually. Yeah. It's like, it, when you look at it from, and then part of my, my book I've written, just what, how would the menopause be from, you know, the male point of view, and you think about how much attention we pay to Viagra and how much attention we pay to the later male sexual prowess and what can we do to help us along and we don't think about it, in most cases the other person being female and that you know it it takes two in in all these situations and particularly like the lesbian couples as well mm. when two two people try and struggle through the menopause together without asking for help it can really really uh, destroy your relationship and and you see that the divorce statistics peak between 45 and 49 and you know, what, well, that would be your perimenopause that doesn't exist on the NHS and nobody talks about. And it's just really interesting, suicide also peaking around the time of peri, perimenopause, menopause. And, you know, that should be the time when we've got our children out of the house on the whole, we're getting on with our careers, we can do all sorts of things, we can have holidays, you know, we sh this should be our time in our space, you know, of people coming into their late 40s and their 50s. And yet it's the time when things go wrong for so many women. And you, you've just got to look at the hormones all the time, you know, as well as everything else that's happening. And we've had a hard enough couple of years, all of us, without our hormones Absolutely. turning on us too, I think. But this, you know, this cream you're talking about um, is quite hard to get hold of, yet men can go and buy Viagra over the counter. Women have to be prescribed that cream and it's quite difficult to get. Yeah, so, I mean, it's dirt cheap, and like I say, there's very few contraindications, whereas there are more contraindications to Viagra. There was, or there is some talk in having one of the treatments, Vagifem, available over the counter, but there's quite big exclusion criteria at the moment. One of them is being age, actually. Um, so whether that will go through, that's still a year away, and the people on the committee are people that don't really see patients, so they don't understand the enormity of the situation. So, <coughs> Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a real, real problem, actually. Yeah, I think all of these things have to come from women up because it's not coming from the medical establishment down. So we really have to inform ourselves and go in and ask for what we need and tell our friends. And, you know, it, it's absolutely happened in that, you know, the numbers of women taking HRT has doubled in the last five years because people have found out it's, it's safe and how to use it. And, you know, it's completely changed. But we really need to talk about it. And, and I feel I never talked about it. It was all very secret. Now, obviously, I talk about it all the time. So. Well, talk some more about, <laughs> um, about HRT. Sort of, again, in both your books, you've got kind of chapters on the HRT debate. Because, um, you know, you say on the back of your book that, you know, all you knew about the menopause was you had a few hot flushes and you shouldn't take HRT. I think there was a report, was it sort of 2002? Um, a report that mm. talked about all the dangers of HRT, which I think is what most people have heard about. But it's yeah. it's very different now, isn't it? Yeah. I'll do danger, you do joy. Um, <laughs> so, so 2002, 20 years ago, really bad time for women when the Women's Health Initiative came out. Um, uh, a report which was the biggest study well, ever into to women taking a, a, HRT. But it was one particular kind of HRT called Premarin or Prempro, which, was made, which were pills which we don't use on the whole anymore. And they were made of horse's urine and synthetic progestin. So they weren't exact copies of your own hormone, which is what the HRT is we can use now, which is called body identical. So you've got this quite dodgy HRT in this huge survey. And what they do is they pick women who are not showing any menopausal symptoms. So the average age of the woman in the study who's given these heavy doses of HRT is 63. And some of them are 79. And they're given HRT for the first time in a in large dose at that age. And I think 60 to 70% of them are obese or overweight. And lots of them have already got problems because they've been smoking and things like that. So it is no surprise at a certain point when the statistics go up for heart attacks and breast cancer among these women. And in fact, when you looked at the women, the younger women in this cohort, the ones from about 50 to 60, they were all doing fine. And it was the older women that they dumped this kind of not great HRT in. That became the gold sort of standard 
for HRT research because there were 16,000 women. It was in America, it was a big study. And you know, that was the time when a million women in Britain threw away their HRT and went cold turkey. And I was astonished because you said to me, look into that in detail. And I read paper after paper after paper. And then I realized that the NHS is still citing this study every day in all their literature. And the people who wrote the study have come out and said it's wrong. This is what we shouldn't have done. Two of them have come out with academic papers. And so it, we, we, you know, no one is looking after us. We need to investigate this. We need to look after this ourselves. We need to know the information and we need to investigate it. And that was, I, mean, I spent a whole chapter talking about this in my book. And you might want to just skim straight through it. But it's really important that it's there. And we know that nobody has made the effort to tell us the truth. And they continue to use this study all the time, particularly in America. And it is just scientifically mostly bollocks. I mean, some of it's quite interesting. Uh, later on, like 18 years on, it's Absolutely. really interesting, it's, isn't it? It Louise? is really interesting. I mean, it was a, it's what it's not it, telling yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, it was a billion dollar study. Not a million, a billion dollar. Never, ever has there been or will there be that much money spent on women's health research. And the reason <laughs> they set it up was because before this time, we were just prescribing HRT all the time, like you prescribe thyroxine if someone's got an underactive thyroid gland. And so they thought, oh, well, it seems so good. Let's see how it is in older women. And as Kate said, you know, these are women with health risks as well. And then they, they stopped the study early and they were trying, I think, and not just me, actually, Robert Langer, who was one of the investigators, said they were trying to find a reason to pull the plug because it was economically so expensive and they were having to justify what the why they were doing a study they weren't really getting any results and then when they were looking at breast cancer and heart disease it was sort of waving over the line and it was sort of waved one way just slightly over so they then decided to um, say there was an increased risk which there was at that time but you know a bit before it was a lower risk of breast cancer and heart disease and um, some of the investigators decided to write to the um, New York Journal uh, uh, New York Herald and also to the medical press. And um, some of the other investigators said, no, we haven't analyzed it properly. Can we stop? And they said, no, it's already gone to press. It's too late. Um, and once it's out in the press, that was it. There was just, if you look at some of the media reports and some of the footage, it was awful, actually. Mm. So they had people who were not gynecologists, not menopause experts, but just saying how dangerous HRT is. And so it wasn't just in, obviously, in the UK and USA worldwide, everybody stopped taking HRT because they were quite rightly scared, which you would be if you think there's this increased risk of disease. And this data has been analyzed and reanalyzed and re reanalyzed. And it has been actually very interesting because, as Kate says, when women start taking HRT within 10 years of their menopause, they have a lower risk of heart disease, osteoporosis diabetes, dementia, you know, and actually lower risk of death from all causes, including from breast cancer. So then you look at, well, what are the risks? Well, this risk of breast cancer was with the horse's urine estrogen with a synthetic progestogen. And women who have their womb have to have some type of progesterone. Um, but this synthetic progesterone as well, that group of women, there did seem to be a slightly higher risk of breast cancer but it was never shown to be statistically significant. Um, if you look at other things that increase risk of breast cancer, so being overweight, drinking moderate amounts of alcohol, not exercising, some studies have shown actually using an electric blanket can increase your risk of breast cancer. Because, <laughs> and this just shows how research can be skewed. Of, of <coughs> course, using an electric blanket, which I do every day, um, doesn't increase your risk. How could it? But that, you know, if, if I had breast cancer and someone said to me, do you use an electric blanket? Yes, I do. Oh, right. And so this is how, you know, this, this sort of sensational reporting. But the risks are still really small. There's not a, a label on a bottle of wine to say risk of breast cancer because it's small. But actually drinking half a bottle of wine most nights increases risk of breast cancer far more than any of these skew data from the WHI. But then, obviously, this came out in 2020. Uh, 2002, it's now 2022, so we've got follow-up data from these women. And what's really interesting, which never hit the front line of the paper, was that women in the study that only took oestrogen, so women who've had a hysterectomy, actually had a 23% lower risk of developing breast cancer, 
and a 40% lower risk of dying from breast cancer. So estrogen seems to be protective from breast cancer. So it's like, well, why is the whole world not realizing this? And then I sometimes think when medicine gets very complicated and you have 10 doctors saying 11 different things, it's really hard to know who's right. So then Avram Blooming, who wrote an amazing book called Estrogen Matters, who's an oncologist in America that we both know quite well. I remember going to a lecture of his a long time ago, and he was saying, which is very obvious when you think about it, if estrogen was so bad, why is it that young women with estrogen are so much more healthy than older women? If estrogen caused breast cancer, then younger women would be more at risk of breast cancer than older women who don't have estrogen because they're menopausal. And then you look at pregnant women. When women are pregnant, their levels of estrogen are sort of 20, 10, 20,000. When we ovulate, our hormones go up to about 1,000 or at estrogen level. So women, you'd expect them to have this accelerated growth of breast cancer or problems when they're pregnant. Of course they don't. And so we also know for a long time that women who have an, um, their ovaries removed when they're young have a greater risk of all the diseases we've mentioned, but also other diseases like kidney disease, lung disease, um, psychosis, drug addiction, mania, all these things because estrogen is so important and testosterone and other female hormone in our bodies. So common sense will tell us that actually how can our own hormones be dangerous? And as, as Kate said, the hormones that we usually prescribe now are body identical, which means down the microscope, they're exactly the same as the hormones we produce. Um, they're derived from the yam plant, so not from pregnant horse's urine, uh, which is quite reassuring to know. But we also give estrogen through the skin. So the risk of clot that we saw with the WHI study with these tablet estrogen, we don't have a risk of clot when estrogen is given as a patch gel or spray. Um, the natural progesterone has never been shown to be associated with a risk of breast cancer. Um, so it's like comparing apples with pears, but even if we stick to the most sensational reporting with the worst statistics from the WHI study, it's still a lot lower. Your, you know, your risk of breast cancer with HRT is lower than your risk of your credit card being cloned. Now, I think you've probably all got credit cards in your pockets. And, you know, and the other thing is we have to remember that breast cancer is very, very common. It affects one in seven women. When I was at medical um, school in the 80s, it was one in 12. And then it was one in 11 when I was a junior doctor. And it's actually increased. Now, we've already heard that millions of women have stopped taking HRT. Actually, if it was all due to HRT, surely that would have reduced. It's increased because women generally are putting on weight, it's a risk factor for breast cancer, drinking more alcohol, lifestyle. There's, there's other reasons why women get breast cancer. So, but we also have to remember that one in seven women taking HRT might develop breast cancer as well, but it doesn't mean it's caused breast cancer. So it's, it's just everyone will think HRT equals breast cancer. And it's yeah. the biggest fear, actually, why women don't want to take <coughs> it. Breast has a risk of breast cancer. Um, so it's not saying it will protect you. Some of the research that we're trying to do actually might show that it does protect from breast cancer because we know that estrogen only HRT is associated with a lower risk. And actually, estrogen used to be a treatment for breast cancer before tamoxifen and some other treatments as well. So. It, you know, there's a lot more to it than estrogen and HRT being bad. Yeah. I also think the thing, when you talk to people and they go, oh, but I want to go the natural route, I'm taking a sage, I'm putting a... Actually, I did a special thing in the book. I interviewed the man who made a fanny magnet, which is a little purple magnet you put here and you put it in your pants and it stops you having hot flushes almost immediately. <laughs> and he did it, he tested it first on his dog that had a stiff leg. And he put the little magnet in his collar and the magnetic powers made the dog's leg get better. And so we, actually I got all my friends to test. I, I, I sent to, I think it's Irish. And I, I sent it and I said, could you send me some? Because I'm testing alternative remedies in my book. And uh, he sent me some and I made, <laughs> I made four of my friends test it. But the worst thing about it was one of my friend's husbands, this is really inappropriate for him, but he had... Um, metal braces on his teeth. <laughs> anyway, I'm just not going to go there for you. But anyway, that is an unnatural remedy. 
for the menopause. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, you, people are, are taking all sorts of stuff which is really expensive and on the whole, you know, it's really not going to make much difference there, you know, in terms of alternatives, maybe CBD oil, um, wonderful things like meditation make a difference to you and exercise and nutrition, you know, actual practical things. But, you know, the hundreds of potions and boots, and believe me, I tried them all, you know, um, they, they really aren't going to make that much difference because the natural solution to your natural problem is to put some of your natural hormone back into your body. And when you look at the picture of that molecule of the new HRT we're using, it is the same molecule, it's exactly the same shape. And um, when you look at the older HRT and you look at the molecule, you think, oh, it's got two other little bits that are doing like, what, what are those two other little bits? What have they gone to in your body? What are they doing? We don't really know. And the, so the idea that you're replacing what you had anyway is a really great plan. And one of the things I sort of learned going along was looking at women uh, with hysterectomies or, or, you know, women in their 30s and 40s who no longer were getting hormones. And their tendency to get dementia is very, very heightened, as well as dying early or heart attacks and other diseases. And you think, well, wait a minute, it's absolutely proven that women who've had hysterectomies are much more likely to get dementia, get osteoporosis, you know, if they have not taken HRT. If they have taken HRT, they're, they're generally fine. And you, you look at that and you think, well, why aren't we looking at ourselves in our 50s and thinking, when are we going to get dementia? When are we going to get osteoporosis? And I think that the long-term effects, that that's the huge kind of secret piece of wonderful knowledge that has come out of, of learning all this, is that, it's, you know, menopause symptoms, hot flushes, it's about the rest of your life. It's about living after you're 50. You're going to live to 83 on average. Do you want to live a good life and help people and change things? Or do you just want to sit at home and have creaky joints? And you think, wow, I don't need to do that. I don't need to necessarily go in for early dementia, early osteoporosis. And one in two women get osteoporosis. Why do we need to do that? We don't. Why has nobody told us that? That, that's the kind of astonishing thing about this kind of menopause revolution, which is that women are realizing, oh, wait a minute, nobody's explained this, and nobody's explained the science of this to me at school. Why haven't they? You know? But this was the thing that really struck me. You know, should, should women that actually don't have any symptoms at all, should they be going and asking for HRT? You know, can you do that? Would your doctor give it to you if you haven't got any symptoms? Because I don't want to get osteoporosis. Mm. But, you know, would my doctor give me a estrogen if I have no symptoms? Probably not, because they might not even give it if you have got symptoms. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at the evidence, so if we look at Cochrane data, which is really good established data, they looked at women who um, had heart disease from, and um, took HRT. And the women who started HRT within 10 years of their menopause, so usually under the age of 60, had around a 50% lower risk of developing heart disease, but also dying from heart disease. So most women die from heart disease and dementia. So that's a really significant reduction. Now, if you look at statins, which GPs are actually paid for to prescribe if cholesterol's raised, then that lowers cardiovascular risk. No good studies have been done in women because women don't normally involved in research but that's another story but but if you translate the male research it's still not as high as 50 percent the other way of reducing a heart attack is by giving a blood pressure lowering treatment if your blood pressure is slightly up that those treatments haven't been shown to reduce the risk of a heart attack in other someone who's otherwise fit and well as much as 50 percent so the effectiveness just for heart disease actually prevention is better with hrt compared to a statin or, or blood pressure lowering treatment. Actually, HRT, body identical hormones, reduces blood pressure, reduces cholesterol as well. Also, as Kate says, reduces osteoporosis, reduces dementia, reduces type 2 diabetes, reduces obesity as well, which is quite good. Um, so it's got other health benefits. So actually, I could argue, based on the evidence, that every menopausal woman should be considered on HRT for their health preventative reasons um, because you know we look at our our sort of risk of getting disease most likely to get heart disease and dementia we've got something that reduces that risk but it's been denied in the uk 
it's around, the average is around 14% uh, of women take HRT, but in some areas it's as low as 2%. Um, I heard recently about a study and they were saying this double the incidence of um, women who are more affluent taking HRT. We know that from other studies compared to women from low socioeconomic classes. But in this one study, it was double, which sounds great, but it was actually the difference between 2% and 4% of women taking HRT. So yeah. it's, it's <clears throat> shocking, isn't it? Yeah. Actually, I was talking to someone who'd done a survey on LinkedIn, which is obviously sort of career women, excuse me. <coughs> and um, it, and it, was a, it was a thousand people, it was menopause X, um, and they found that 63% of the women who lined up for this survey on LinkedIn were on HRT. So it's obviously execs have got the secret, they're all at it. And you know, you go into, certainly we were filming in parts of Glasgow for this latest film, and basically, you know, the first line treatment is antidepressants. And the really good HRT is not available in parts of Scotland at all. You know, the safer body identical stuff, unless you ask specially for it, it's not even on the formulary. And that's what we're doing. We've got this kind of elite of white women mostly at the top, taking their HRT, getting on with their jobs. And then you've got 50% of nurses are uh, over 50 and a third of them want to leave their jobs. Who on earth do we need more at this point in time than nurses? who should be getting the help at kind of menopause clinics. And, you know, they're just not finding that kind of help. And so it's a real kind of class poverty issue as well. And, and we really, really need to, and race, race as well, it is a real problem. And we need to get, I know, I know you're discussing this, but to get our message into communities that aren't hearing this and in, in languages that, that aren't. And we had a wonderful person on the, the first documentary we made called Dr. Nigat Arif, who is a, a friend of yours as well, who um, does menopause talks in, in Urdu and Punjabi on uh, TikTok. And so you hear her going, and you, you have no idea what she's saying. She's going, blah, blah, blah. Vaginal dryness, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> TikTok. And she does these fantastic, and all younger people are taking them to their mums and going, mom, you know, and so she's reached out into her community and you know in the language they understand through kind of the social media their children understand i mean that that's that's the sort of thing we should be thinking about and you know so reaching disadvantaged groups yeah. is so important in fact i've just found out today that a copy of this book is going to every prison oh, which great. is great because prison um, inmates <coughs> obviously aren't have don't have access to the phones so they can't use the balance app the only healthcare professional they often have access to are psychiatrists or mental health who mm. have no training or no one has training in the menopause, but they really don't. Um, and so it's really, really important. So yeah, so that's a really good bit of news. But I think every group of women are disadvantaged when it comes to menopause. I can't get HRT for my GP, despite being a <laughs> white middle-class educated menopause specialist because my GP practice don't really like prescribing HRT. So. There's this real um, inequality of care, isn't it? It's, it's shocking. Actually, I can't get HRT either because my, my chemist has run out with all, of all kinds of transdermal HRT today. But hopefully I will at some point. But, you know, there's huge shortages. I mean, no one is helping us with this. And it's very interesting. It's a real, it needs political intervention. And we've got the wonderful Karen, Carolyn Harris MP who's about to cause, I think, some more trouble about this. But... Really, it's, it's interesting how neglected we are and how keen we are to ask for help, but we're not being allowed to. Really. What advice would you give us? Like, you know, what do we need to say to the GP? I think the most important thing is to be empowered with information is number one, and to make sure that the information that you read is evidence-based and trustworthy because there's now a massive market of menopause supplements, mm -hmm. menopause, all sorts of things, you know, every day we read articles that fill with horror and um, just, I'm sure you all know, but just to be really transparent, I don't do any paid work with any pharmaceutical company, I don't endorse any products, I'm not behind anything, I don't have a hidden agenda, but um, every day I do get asked to promote a product to be associated with something and, and I don't, and these requests are increasing even more because people are cottoning on it half the population, we could make lots of money and everything else. Um, so I think as a, well, I think I'm menopausal now, but because I started HRT when I was perimenopausal, who knows what's happening to my own hormones. But 
Um, as a perimenopausal woman, I had no idea what was going on in my, with my body, despite it being a time when I was setting up my clinic and my website. I just thought I was too tired and irritable because my husband was annoying me and, um, uh, um, and just getting a bit old, really. But then I obviously realized what was going on. But it's very difficult when your brain doesn't work to think about how to look after yourself when you've got your children and your job and everything else going on as well. So hence the preparing bit is really key. So it's really important to get that knowledge before it happens, which most of us, it's too late. But then it's actually deciding what we want to do. And everyone's going to have a different menopause and a different perimenopause. Everyone's going to choose different treatments as well. And I think that's really important that we all know that because some people will want to take HRT really early. And one of the reasons I wanted to take HRT early was, well, partly I didn't want to have some of the symptoms that some of my patients have experienced. But more importantly, I'm really worried about osteoporosis. And I really don't want my bones to thin as quickly as they could if my hormones drop. So I'm taking HRT because I want to improve my future health. Other people might decide that they want to try other things. Or the other thing is, is also looking at what else are we doing at the same time? You know, HRT is great, but there's no point in me having HRT, smoking 20 a day, eating McDonald's for breakfast and sitting on the sofa every evening and not doing any exercise. I could choose that if I wanted, but actually I want to get the best out of my future health. So I want to be able to do yoga regularly. I'm quite happy that I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke and I don't go to McDonald's. Um, but that's a personal choice and we all make decisions in life. But I think it's really important that we are armed with the right information. But if we do want treatment, then we can help our own healthcare professional by having the information. So um, with the app that I developed, we've got the health report where people can fill out a symptom questionnaire it's also on the menopause charity website, on the balance-menopause website as well. So that if you go to your GP with the questionnaire completed and you say, I think I'm perimenopausal or menopausal, I would like to talk to you about getting body identical hormones, if that's what you want, then you, you've started the conversation. And rather than me as a doctor going, have you got any flushes? What's your sleep like? What's your memory like? Have you got a headache? Da, da, da. That will take my whole 10-minute consultation. But if they're ticked on a questionnaire, I can very quickly home in on what's, what's worse, which of the symptoms affect you most. And then we can have eight or nine minutes talking about HRT. And we're finding that the conversation is really changing because women are so empowered now that when they come, they can start talking. And a lot of them say, well, I'd really like that gel if I could get hold of it or I quite like a patch. Or we can then get treatment a lot quicker because we did a survey um, a while ago and we showed that 10% of women, it took at least eight GP appointments just to get the diagnosis, let alone treatment. And 50% of women, it took more than a year before they received treatment. Well, why? Because we don't need to do a blood test. We don't need to wait for an investigation. So we should be starting treatment in the first or maybe second consultation when people are more empowered with information. But unfortunately, it's one of the, one of the sort of main conditions that we really have to do a lot of homework ourselves. You know, if, if I had high blood pressure, if I had type on diabetes and needed insulin, or I've had an underactive thyroid gland, I would get treatment like that very quickly. But unfortunately, and part of it is because healthcare professionals haven't got the training. They're not there to be resistant and obstructive and annoying. They actually don't understand the health benefits because they've been given for 20 years about how dangerous HRT is. So, And a lot of GPs, it says in your book, don't actually, or do they have a few-hour module on the menopause? Yeah, something? I mean, traditionally, it's often gynecologists that train about the menopause, but most of us, I didn't have any formal undergraduate or postgraduate training at all. Um, so they often don't know, or if they have been taught, it might be taught by someone who has been taught about how dangerous HRT mm -hmm. is. So. so basically, we all need to read <laughs> books. Um, I've got loads more questions for you, but um, I'm sure lots of people here uh, we'll have questions. So general, general questions would be great. One here. <coughs> Is all of the HRT on the NHS body identical or not? No. It, so there's a combination of products available. If you open the BNF, the British National Formulary, or go online, you'll see there's lots and lots of different products. So 
as a rule of thumb, the oestrogen on its own that comes as a patch gel or spray, and there's different types of gels, there's different types of patches, and there's one spray, are all body identical, called oestradiol, so it's 17 beta oestradiol. And then um, there is a type of patch that's a combination patch. It's got oestrogen and a progestogen in it, but it's a synthetic progestogen. Um, so the oestrogen bit's body identical, the progestogen bit isn't. The only progesterone, so the natural body identical progesterone available in the UK is a capsule called Utrogestan. So there are other types of progestogens, which is the synthetic progesterone, um, like norethisterone or medoxyprogesterone acetate, which are actually in the progesterone only pill, which should be progestogen only pill, because progestogen is the synthetic um, progesterone, which um, can be given as part of HRT, but it's synthetic. The tablets, there is a combination tablet of natural oestrogen and utrogestan, the natural progesterone called Bijuve, which is actually really good and it doesn't seem to have a clot risk, but it's only available in two CCGs um, in, in the UK. Yeah, you can get it. No, no, it's just a nightmare. Um, all the other combination tablets are all synthetic. Yeah. So you've got to know what, so you've got to ask for utrogestan or a marine coil if you want. That, that's the safest ways of, of yeah. dealing with it. Um, has it. Does anyone tell you that on the NHS website? They do yeah, not. If you go to the <coughs> balance-menopause.com website and put in easy in the search, there's an easy HRT prescribing guide, which I've written for healthcare professionals, but a lot of women actually download it, print it off, and say to their doctor, this is what I want. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, Leanne, yeah, have you got a question? Yes, oh, I do. Um, so one of the questions that's come in from Kim is, what's the best way to combat middle of the night, wide awakeness and daily tiredness? <laughs> so there's lots of reasons why people don't sleep, but one of the commonest reasons is not having enough hormones. It's one of the first things a lot of people thank me for is having their sleep back. And sleep disturbance is a really, really common symptom of the perimenopause and menopause. And we have to remember that not sleeping is a form of torture. Um, and most menopausal women um, have sleep disturbances. Some people find it hard to get to sleep. A lot of women find they get to sleep fine and they have this wide awake, three, four in the morning. What am I doing? This is so annoying because I'm going to be tired the next day. And sometimes people are woken up because they're dripping in sweat with night sweats. But often it's just because the hormones, estrogen, progesterone, but also testosterone, which we produce more of than estrogen, are really important for our hormones. So you know what I'm going to say, replacing the hormones is the best. The anxiety yeah. is incredible, isn't it? Yeah. And um, there's a recent survey, which we're, we're going to talk about eventually in, a, in the program, but it looks like about 70% of women suffer menopausal anxiety. Mm. And that, that's a, that, that kind of 4 a.m. like, what have I done? Have I done that? Mm, you, know, and, and you, you know, I still get it now and then, but it, it really is. Well, the other thing you need to do, I think, is meditate. I think that makes a huge difference is meditation or yoga to, to bring that down because you, do, mm. you do suddenly find that sort of pinging open in the middle of the night and it's really, really hard to deal with. Or keep a sort of piece of paper by your bed and write down the five things you've thought of in the middle of the night. And often actually they're quite useful. You've gone through a lot of things, <laughs> sorted out a few people, and I'm going to kill him, you know, whatever it is. But, you know, I, I still find that and I'm on yeah. HRT and, and if, if I have a bit of a dip, I'm, I'm like 4 a.m. Mad. Yeah. yeah. But it's so common. It's not that we're weird, it's that we're normal. <clears throat> How close are we to getting um, testosterone being able to be pre um, prescribed on the NHS? Because I've had to get it prescribed um, privately, and it's very useful. <laughs> yeah, it's a real, it's a real, oh, it's just a travesty, isn't it? That we're not allowed our own hormone back. So testosterone is produced in our ovaries. We produce three or four times more testosterone than estrogen. Seven years ago, I didn't even know women produced testosterone, and now I'm the largest subscriber in the world, probably, of <laughs> testosterone. Um, but that's not just because I use it myself and find that my brain works, whereas it didn't work without testosterone. It's because I've read quite a lot of studies and I've used common sense. And, you know, actually, testosterone is very safe, but as you rightly say, it's not licensed. Um, it is licensed in Australia. There's an Australian queen called Androfem, which we are allowed to prescribe privately. It costs about 80p a day, so I choose not to eat chocolate, so a Mars bar a day or testosterone. It's, you know, 
Um, but it, it, there is a move to get it licensed. Um, women can still get HRT, uh, testosterone through the NHS, but it has to be the male testosterone because, of course, men are allowed their own hormone back. Um, so we can prescribe testosterone gel um, in a lower dose for women in the NHS if the doctor feel, or the clinician feels confident and has had mm. some training, which often doesn't happen. Um, so the MHRA have done their first sort of round with Androfem. I was at the meeting um, before COVID, so it feels like ages ago, but probably two and a half years ago. Um, and they're producing a dossier of more and more um, evidence. What has been good about coming out of the EU is that now it's become licensed in Australia, it might be easier to be licensed over here. And so mm -hmm. there has been talk that it should be this year. I think it's probably going to be next year. But it will happen, and it's got to happen, because it's absolutely outrageous that we're not allowed our own hormone back. But we have to say it's because our libidos are low. That's the nice guidelines, isn't yeah. it? You have to say, oh, my libido's low, could I have some testosterone? And in fact, it makes a huge difference to your brain power mm. and memory and energy, or certainly that's what we find in kind of observational studies. Yeah, totally. Um, because <coughs> testosterone is a very, it, it, it works in every cell around our body, so it can really help with mood, energy, concentration, stamina, muscle strength, um, joint pain, sleep, um, lots of reasons. Actually, it can help even with hair growth. Everyone thinks they're going to go bald if they're on testosterone. But all we're doing is just replacing the missing hormone. We're not going to go into supra-physiological levels. So do you, I do see some women who have side effects, and they're usually women that have gone to compound bioidentical clinics, so having hormones that are completely unlicensed and unregulated, or they've been using the male pump packets of testosterone, and you can often get quite high levels with that. So we usually use the little tubes or sachets of male testosterone in lower doses, because it's easier to just have smaller doses every day. I wonder if either of you can say anything positive about the experience of menopause. And I don't mean about the response or the treatment, but about the experience itself. <coughs> Excuse me, I've still got the remains of three week old COVID. Um, I, I found it in the end to be one of the best things that's ever happened to me. And it's a sort of portal that completely changed my life, what I did, and indeed kind of gave me this amazing purpose, which was sort of fighting this fight. Um, but also, I think that you, your brain genuinely does change during menopause. And even if you are taking HRT and change, you are changing. And um, you want to take advantage of that change and kind of, in the end, you know, be more honest, be more direct, be more who you are, do the job you want to do, you know, age 50 or whatever. I do think it's the time where we can kind of confidently walk forward and kind of make space for ourselves and, and really not spend our time worrying what other people think about us. Um, so, I mean, I think to see it as a portal uh, to the next 33 years, if not more, of your life and look at what you are going to do with that life that's been given to you and how you're going to positively use it, I, I think it's really important. And, and actually, even you know, if you're not taking HRT, your grey matter in perimenopause goes down like that. And then it starts coming up again, and nobody's bothered to see what happens there. But your gray matter genuinely does take this bend in the middle where it goes down, and then your brain pumps more um, blood, um, basically post-menopause. Unfortunately, your white matter goes down the connective tissue, and it doesn't really seem to come back up again. So there's very good reasons for taking HRT, but it is interesting to say that your brain genuinely does change in the way that all our brains changed in pregnancy and rebooted and there is this rebooting and it's about how you're going to play with that rebooting and whether you want to go one route or another and it's sort of your choice but I, I think it's really exciting. <clears throat> Can you ever reverse the physical um, vaginal atrophy? symptoms yes usually so I'm, you can. I'm shocked by what i discovered about yeah that. usually you can um but often when i see quite a few people have had very severe symptoms and um, sometimes they've come very quickly but often it's been a long time and there's been a lot of women who have 
really missed out for maybe a decade or two without hormones. And so um, often it's a combination of treatments. So although I've said there are the uh, vaginal treatments, the, the sort of vaginal tablets, creams, pessaries, gels, whatever, sometimes we use a combination of treatments which can make a real difference. So they might, people might insert um, a vaginal ring or a tablet and then use externally some gel or cream in combination with HRT. And a lot of women, it can take quite a few months to improve, which can be really frustrating if you've got symptoms. Um, but patience really is a virtue. And a lot of women find that they gradually improve. So I've got a few patients who have taken 18 months to really make a difference. Um, but it's gone in the right direction. So it's really important. Some people find that some of the localized treatments can be very painful, not because of the hormone, but because of the preparation, you know, the formulation of the the gel or the cream. So sometimes changing to the, there's a little plasticky ring called an S-string which lasts for three months. And that can be really nice because it's very easy to insert and it doesn't have a sort of messiness or a sort of another ingredient that's going to irritate the area. Because you can imagine if the area is very thin um, with no, not much blood supply, it's very smarting. It really can be quite uncomfortable using some of the preparations. So um, there's, there's, it's nice to have a choice, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, so often the anatomy can, re a lot of women don't even recognize their own vulva. There's been all sorts of experiments, haven't there, where they've taken photos and you recognize them. People are like, I've got no idea. It's not like men who are just playing with their penises the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, but it can really change. And, and in fact, I remember one of my first patients, um, and I sat at my clinic, was a psychiatrist. I, I gave a presentation at the Royal College of Psychiatrists about depression or menopause, which is it? And um, obviously it can be both. Um, and um, this psychiatrist had come to see me herself and she'd had a hysterectomy about two years ago. And she came with a very long floaty skirt. I remember her really well and she'd come, it was all pre-COVID and she lived in Guernsey. So she'd come on a, on, a, on a bus and a boat and a train and all sorts to come and see me. And she said, I think I've been mutilated by the surgeon. Now she's a medical doctor and she said, not long after the operation, I looked down and she said, I had no clitoris, I've got no, no vulva, I've got no labia majora, no labia minora. And it, it's just, and I think they've done more to me. And she was very obsessive, very worried, very anxious, which is very, very common symptoms of the menopause anyway. And I said, would you mind, can I examine you? She said, well, no one's ever examined me before. Yes, of course. So she lifted up her skirt, wasn't wearing underclothes because it was all so painful. And she was, really, and I was a bit, oh gosh, that really doesn't look right at all. And I said, well, I'm sure it's related to your, your menopause and everything else. So I gave her HRT, gave her some treatment. And um, in fact, I saw her recently in the clinic. She's horse riding now and she's just loving her life and she's great. Um, but it took a long time. And actually we were talking when I saw her because she was so well, we could reminisce about the awfulness of what's happened. And, and the anatomy really, really reverses very well. If you think in childbirth, any of you have had children, how your vulva and perineum look quite soon after having a baby is not very pleasant often. And it improves very quickly, and especially when you give treatment, the vascularity improves. So the more blood flow, when you've got blood flow in, a, in an area, it will give all the nice chemicals that will help with the tissue healing and everything else. So anatomy will really, really reverse. And it's quite can be quite shocking. I mean, often it's not as harrowing as that experience, but it can really change and it's important that people know, but it can take a quiet time. Hello. You've said now that it's not a sort of five, ten year phase that you go through. So if you've been lucky enough to be prescribed HRT, should we be staying on it for the rest of our life? Indeed, yes. Yeah. So the guidelines are very clear. So we, we use the NICE menopause guidance, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence guidelines, and they're very clear that women should have an annual review if they're on HRT. And every year we just monitor and see, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Well, we've got lots of benefits of HRT. But there aren't actually many risks. But even if the risks outweigh the benefits, we've got another um, guidance from NICE called the Shared Decision-Making Guidance. We've also got GMC consent, um, the General Medical Council consent. So even if the risks were 30 times more than we've been talking about tonight, but me as an individual wanted to take HRT because I was more worried about osteoporosis or dementia, 
then I can still choose a treatment that has more risks and benefits. So actually, that's where it's all about individualization. We also have to remember that whether I, I could stop my HRT now and I might not have any symptoms because symptoms can last for five years, seven years, or they can last for decades. My symptoms might have gone, great, but I'm gonna have these health risks. So again, it's, so it's a long-term hormone deficiency, the same way that you take thyroxine for, forever or, or insulin forever, yes, you can. A lot of people um, have been thinking, oh, we have to stop at a certain time, a certain age, uh, because of the breast cancer risk. Well, if you're taking the synthetic progesterone, it does seem there's, a, there's an increased risk the longer you take it, but the risk is still really low anyway. If you have the natural progesterone, there's never been a good quality study showing there's an increased risk of breast cancer. Estrogen only, we know, has a lower risk. So the problem is, is that the MHRA, the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority, still say there's a risk of breast cancer, clot, stroke, heart attack with any type of HRT, including the vaginal hormones. So if you open your insert associated with your HRT, it will say this. But more worryingly, when I describe HRT on the computer, it will come up with a warning risk of all these things. And we're trying to work with the MHRA for them to change it. Um, but, you know, but again, if you just go back to the evidence and see that it's all there and it's safe. The evidence is your mum. <coughs> <laughs> Louise's mum is very much on HRT and she won't reveal her age. <laughs> I interviewed her for my book. <laughs> yeah. But my she said she was... Yeah. In her 70s. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but she is in brilliant form and she's still a drama and music examiner, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah, she's definitely. But she, she's a very, very feisty woman. Just, and I interviewed a couple of people like that who were in their 80s. And there's a woman who swims in the icy cold pond at Hampstead every day who's 90 and takes a pump of oestrogen every second day. Um, I think we've got time for one more question and one here. Okay. Hello, um, my question is about osteoporosis. If you've got a diagnosis of osteoporosis, um, can going on HRT reduce um, or how does it help basically? Yeah, so it's actually, um, HRT is licensed for the treatment of osteoporosis, which most osteoporosis specialists don't realize. Um, we've just had some new guidance from the National Osteoporosis Guideline Group, NOG, and they have um, not recommended HRT as first line um, because they're using outdated evidence and sensationalizing the risk. But it is actually a treatment for osteoporosis in women under the age of 60. Um, but we certainly um, do a lot of bone scans on women or a lot of women have had bone densities done because that's the only way to diagnose osteoporosis. And we've really seen a lot of women whose bone density increases. But we know that estrogen helps build osteoblasts which are the uh, building cells in, in in the bone and reduces osteoclasts which break down bone so yeah absolutely yeah so sorry can it, it there's studies that show bones regrowing up to three and four percent um per annum on on hrt yeah no it's really worth a try uh, one more question yeah Sarah has asked, how can we deal with the disparity between different doctors and how they deal with giving HRT or not? Yeah, so this is a great question and it comes up a lot. And um, I think the important thing is to try and choose the healthcare professional that you see. And it's not just doctors. So it might be there's a nurse at the practice who prescribes. A lot of um, practices now have pharmacists that can prescribe as well. So it's worth, before you book the appointment, asking. <laughs> Um, is there someone who's got a special interest in the menopause and that might help? If you don't get the, treat the treatment that you want, um, then it's worth going back and maybe speaking to someone else. Sometimes people find that actually writing a letter or writing down what they want can be helpful because I know myself, I get a bit nervous going to see my doctor because I always think I'm wasting their time, they're really busy and I'm going, they're running late and I've only got a few minutes and I get all a bit flustered. So actually to write down what you want or to write down why you were disappointed maybe with the first consultation can be useful. On the menopause charity website we've written, um, there's just a little sort of PDF that you can download and print off and some tips about how to help. And we have to remember that every clinician wants to do the best. They get up in the morning and they don't think I want to be really obstructive to my patients. They actually want, you know, we've all been qualified to help. 
So they want to, but they've not had the right training. They don't necessarily know what's best. So they might think that antidepressants is best, or they might not actually be able to recognize all the symptoms. So um, what we need to do is not be too confrontational, because then if we have another non-menopause related problem, it might really affect our doctor-patient relationship. So I think it is really important that we can say, well, actually, I have read the NICE guidance. I have read information about menopause. I have decided this is the treatment I want. And when we use words like the NICE guidance on menopause, NICE guidance on shared decision making, then actually it would be a very brave or unwise doctor to then refuse. So what they might say initially and what they might say at the end of the consultation or even say at the second consultation, say, well, I'm going to make another appointment because I feel that it hasn't gone the way that I wanted. I'm going to come back or can I see a colleague and I really want HRT because I know there are benefits for my future health. Then a lot of people are finding that's really working well. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've got any other advice. No, it's a second opinion is a very mm. good idea and ask for a referral to a menopause clinic which may take you six months or something. But, mm. Six years. <laughs> <coughs> it was worth a try though, yeah. Mm. yeah. And the other thing I wanted to say before we finished is we <coughs> made another uh, menopause documentary with Davina McCall. It's been the last six months of my life. And um, it's out on May the 2nd on Channel 4 at 9 p.m. And it's called Sex, Mind and the Menopause. So lots of it's about what's going on in your mind and what happens to the mind in perimenopause and menopause and the link between Alzheimer's and menopause, which is very interesting. So we've got some New York doctors coming on to talk about that. Um, so, so look out for it and, and you know, put it on your social media and tell your friends so that you know, the more people that hear what's going on with themselves, the better, I think. Yeah, we'll definitely be watching that. Yeah. Um, Kate and Reid, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating listening to you tonight. And um, I hope Ben has warned Ross Charles to have surgery. <laughs> this event has been taking place because I think they might have some visits. Um, <laughs> but I can't recommend these books highly enough. Um, Kate and Louise are very kindly um, going to stay and uh, do a quick signing. Um, but I know, you know, they've both very kindly travelled a long way. They've got journeys back. They've got work tomorrow. So, um, you know, I don't think they're going to be able to answer individual questions. But honestly, you will, you will find a lot of the answers here. Or you've got an amazing app, the Balance app, yeah. um, which will also answer lots of questions as well. So, um, can we give them a... <laughs>